Number five. Yeah, number five. <coughs>
your Bible this morning to the Gospel of Matthew once again, chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. Now what we're looking at this morning is the fact that man can see outward things and observe outward things, and oftentimes he takes pride in outward things that people can see. God is concerned with your heart. And we're going to talk about that this morning. In verse 1 of chapter 15, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Of course, they were constantly, always following him around, not because they believed his message. They certainly didn't like him. They were trying to entrap him, trying to get him to say something where they could accuse him, trying to ask him questions they felt like, you know, However he responds to this, we've got him now. And we see them once again doing the same thing. In verse 2, why do thy disciples transgress? Now notice, it doesn't say transgress what the scriptures teach. He says, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Now let me say this for just a second. There's nothing wrong with tradition. If it's something that is positive, it's something that lifts up Jesus, that exalts Jesus, one thing that's wrong is we've done away with a lot of good traditions and developed some that were not so good. But here's the thing about a tradition. Keep this in mind. It is not on par with, nor does it take precedence or equal to what the Word of God teaches. And many people sometimes get to the point where they feel like their traditions are as important as what the Word of God teaches, and they're not. Or not, but that being said, there are some traditions that are good traditions. Okay, now here's the problem they have with Jesus: for they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, there's nothing wrong with being sanitary, is there? And the Lord's not teaching that we shouldn't be sanitary. But what He's teaching, if we want to see, is that that has nothing to do with your spiritual condition whether or not your hands are washed before you eat a meal. But you see, I don't think the Pharisees were concerned about sanitation or being sanitary. This was an opportunity for them to show how pious and how religious they were. And ceremoniously, it was a ceremony to them, look at me, I washed my hands before I ate. You know, you're, you know, that's all it was about. It was about promoting themselves. Lifting up themselves so they could feel good about themselves and look down upon others and say, I'm more religious than you are. I'm more committed to God than you are. And to take something as simple as this and to use it in that manner, that's exactly what they were doing. And they noticed that Jesus and his disciples didn't wash their hands before they eat. And Christ says, that doesn't defile a man. And I'll tell you one thing, I'm thankful for that. Because I don't remember the last time I ever washed my hands when I was out working and eating, you know, like that. So I'm glad it might, might give me some germs I don't need to get, but it's not going to defile me spiritually, is it? But anyway, that's 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 what they thought. That that's that's how they looked at things and saw things. You see, they weren't about anything but promoting themselves and lifting themselves up and their own self righteousness and being able to look at other people and say, Look, I'm more religious than you are. But you see that's the same thing today, though. People do the same thing, maybe not with the washing of the hands part, but you have so many people who like to give the impression, I'm very religious, I'm more religious than you are. I do this and I don't do that. My friend, it's what's on the inside that matters. It's what's in your heart that counts, not what you look like, not this particular tradition, that particular tradition, that's not what God's looking for. God's concerned with your heart. What's on the inside? We'll talk about that as we continue reading through the scripture. He says in verse 3, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? He calls them out on this one thing that they was common practice for them to do. It says, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curses father and mother or mother, let him die the dead. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift.
By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You see, here was a common practice that they did to excuse themselves, so to speak, of financially, if it was necessary, supporting mom and dad. They would simply say to them, look, I can't help you because I've dedicated all I have to God. That's what they did. To make themselves appear to be very religious. To bring attention to them. Look at me. I am so devoted to God. But Christ is saying, the reason you're doing it is because you want to neglect your financial obligation to provide for your mom and dad as they get older. So that's why you're doing it. It's not about you being religious. It's about you covering your own tracks, so to speak. And you do this to appear to others to be religious, but that's what he said. Now you've broken the commandment of God by your tradition. That's what he's saying to them. Look what he calls them in verse 7. Hypocrite. Now, really what a hypocrite is is someone pretending to be something they're not, isn't it? Play acting a part, so to speak, isn't it? Well, they were pretending to be the religious leaders of their day, weren't they? They were pretending to be in the right relationship with God by some of the outward things that they were doing. Ceremoniously, the things that they were doing. But on the inside, you see, here's the thing. God not only sees what you do. I can see what you do. Well, you know, unless you hide it from me. But I don't know why you did it. I praise God. There's 81 people in your church today. Praise the Lord. I can see you. I don't know why you're here. I have no idea why you came this morning. You do. And God knows. But see, I don't know. You see, that's what people need to realize. All I can see is that you're here, and I'm thankful that you are here. Praise God. And I pray that you receive a blessing from being here. But I don't know what motivates you to get out of bed and come here. But you see, God does. And that's what God's concerned with as well. Why you do what you do? What's on the inside of you? What's in your heart that you can hide from man, but you can't hide from God? You hypocrites, he calls them. Now this was, you know, oh, this burnt them up because they really believed that Jesus should be catering to them. He should be patting them on the back and applauding them and praising them for how religious they were because Outwardly, they appeared to be so, didn't they? But you know, he told them one time, he said, you're just like a tomb, a sepulcher. He said, you're whitewashed on the outside, but you're rotten on the inside. You see, God is concerned with your heart. He's concerned with your heart. He says, you hypocrites, well did a size prophesy of you saying, this people draw off nigh to me with their mouth and off me with their lips, but their heart is what? Far from God. Me. And we'll talk about how important it is for your heart to be right with the Lord and have your heart cleansed and your motivation for what you do in the right place. It says, oh, you appear to worship, you appear, but your heart is far removed from me. You don't do it for the right reason. You don't do it because you love me. You don't do it because... You do it because you want to draw attention to yourself. You want to make a name. You want to promote yourself and be seen of people so that people can applaud you and praise you. He says, you're a hypocrite. That's what he's saying to them. Verse 9, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Be careful. Be careful. As I said, we talked a little bit about tradition. People have their own opinions and their own convictions. <coughs> but do not teach them as the Word of God. Understand and realize you're entitled to your own convictions. You're entitled to your traditions. But that's what they are. That's all they are. But many people want to impose them upon others as being the absolute truth. No. Understand that and realize that. The truth is words of God. It's God's word. That's it. And do not replace the word of God with the commandments of men and your opinions and your convictions and your traditions, my friend. 
He continues in verse 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Because what you speak and what you say reveals what's in your heart, doesn't it? It does. That's what he's saying. He says, you know, you're focused and concerned about what you're eating, what's going into you. God's concerned about what's coming out of you comes from your heart. Because that reveals who you are, doesn't it? It reveals what you think. It reveals your priorities. It reveals your love. It reveals so much about you, doesn't it? And that's what he's saying right here. God is focused on and concerned with your heart. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Well, you offended those people. Well, those, those are well thought of religious people, and you offended them. Christ didn't apologize for it, though, did he? No. You see, here's the thing about it. People need to be offended. Everybody needs to be offended. Everybody needs to know you're a sinner. And you deserve to die and you deserve to go to hell. That's what everybody needs to know. I don't care if it offends them or not. It's the truth. And I'm not going to apologize for the truth of God's word. There's never been a person outside the Lord Jesus Christ has walked upon the face of this earth. They could go to heaven based upon their own merits. But he was the perfect, sinless, holy son of God who gave himself for us on Calvary's cross. Everybody else disqualified because of your sin. That's offensive to some people. Some people don't like to be called a sinner. Well, I'm just as good as you are. Well, that doesn't help you a bit. I'm going to die and go to hell, except I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I'm not going to because of that. I'm not going to go to heaven because I've done anything great or anything I've ever done, or anything I haven't done, I'm going to heaven because I know Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. I put my faith and trust in Him. So if, if, if I'm your standard, my friend, you need a better standard than me. If you're just as good as me, what is that going to get you? Nowhere. Or anybody else you want to use. You see, the standard is Jesus Christ. You see, He was perfect. He was sinless. I'm not. I'm filled with faults and shortcomings and sin. I acknowledge that and I realize that. And I'm so thankful and glad that Jesus Christ came and took my sin upon him and paid for it on Calvary's cross where that I can have through faith in him eternal life. So yes, they're offended, Jesus. So what? They need to be. People need to be. They need to be told the truth. You know, we live in a damn time or that we have become so sensitive to being politically correct that you really can't say something that might offend somebody. Well, let me tell you something. I'm not for going out and intentionally trying to hurt somebody by saying something about them, maliciously trying to cut them down and bring them down. But I'm going to say, I'm going to say this. I will not apologize for the Word of God. And the truth of what God's word teaches. If it offends you, then that's between you and the Lord. I don't have the authority to apologize for the Bible. I'm not going to apologize for the Bible. It teaches the Bible what the Bible teaches. I've been called to preach the word of God, the truth from the word of God. And if it offends, then let it offend, my friend. It needs to offend. It needs to, people need to be offended. They need to be told the truth. And when you tell people the truth, it does offend them, doesn't it? It's just, they're offended because Jesus told them the truth. He said, look, you all say that you worship God, you say that you're right with God, and you ceremoniously go through all these traditions and rituals to prove and to show people that you are. He said, your heart is rotten. Your motivation is wrong. You're not right with me. You're not right with me. And that's what he's saying to them right now. And he didn't apologize for them being offended. The disciples were kind of, you know, taken back with that. Man, you've offended some important people here. Let them be offended. He goes on and he says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. I'll tell you what, my friend, if it's not of God, it'll eventually come to naught, won't it? And that's what he's saying about the Pharisees and their religious system and their beliefs and their attitudes. Let them alone. 
They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. You see a lot of that happening today, the blind leading the blind, my friend. Blinded by the lies of Satan. Blinded from the truth of God's word and what God's word teaches. And many people are plummeting out into eternity to a devil's hell to be spent there forever and ever because why? They refuse to believe the truth. They will not accept the truth. The truth has offended them. The truth is this. We can talk about a lot of different things. But the central point, the central truth is this. Man is lost. He is going to die and he is going to go to hell. If God doesn't intervene. There's nothing you can do to save yourself or anybody else that you know that can save you. The only one that can save you is Jesus Christ. And what he did for you on Calvary, you've got to be willing to humble yourself. See, that begins in the heart, doesn't it, being humble. And that's against man's nature to be humble. <coughs> it is, isn't it? Man, is, he's, not, he's not humble by nature. God has to humble him. Now, there's some people more humble than others, granted for that, but, you know, it's not our nature to be that way. It's our nature to be proud and be independent and self-sufficient. But you've got to be willing to humble yourself and acknowledge the fact you are lost. There's nothing you can do or anyone else can do to save you. But Jesus is the one that can. You've got to be willing to acknowledge that sin, admit what that sin has done to you, and accept what Jesus did for you on Calvary's cross, the fact that he paid your sin debt for you, and believe and trust in that, and God will give you eternal life. That's the simple point. That's the message. That's the, the heart of the gospel message. Man is lost. He's a sinner. He's doomed. Jesus paid sin's debt through faith in him. You can receive eternal life. That's it. That's it. That's the truth. That's what we're talking about right here. So, don't be led by the blind. Be led by the truth. And I know Satan's going to tell you the Word of God. He attacks the Word of God. He has vessels, instruments that attack the Word of God, humans who attack the Word of God with their philosophies and their, you know, uh, scientific data and all these kinds of things. They try to critique and criticize and, and, and try to discredit God's Word. It's out there. I understand that. I realize that. But you've got to decide who you're going to believe. Who you're going to believe. I think I'll believe the one who created all things by speaking it into existence. I choose to believe in God, just like Joshua said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to believe the Lord. You've got to decide who you're going to believe. You can be led by the blind and fall into that ditch he's talking about, or you can choose to allow God to soften and open, soften your heart and open up your eyes and get you to see the truth. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. <coughs> Jesus said, Are ye also without understanding, yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out in the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. You see, it's all about your heart, isn't it? That reveals who you really are. And that's what God is concerned with. That's what Jesus was concerned with when he spoke to these Pharisees and these Sadducees and these people in presence, he was trying to get them to see and to understand and to realize it's the heart that matters, isn't it? That's what matters. Because your actions and what you do are a result of what? What you believe. What you say is a result of what you believe, isn't it? It is. And that's what he's saying right here. 
part is so vital and so important. There's some scriptures. You know, you believe with the heart, don't you? You know, you believe. You love from the heart, don't you? You sing from the heart. You obey from the heart. You give from the heart. You pray from the heart. You see why it's so important? Why God is so concerned with your heart and the condition of your heart? Not what you look like outwardly, but what you look like inwardly. We need to be focused. And don't neglect your physical appearance. God doesn't, doesn't want you to neglect your physical appearance. God wants you to go clean. I mean, you know, you know. But how many people are so focused and concerned with their physical appearance and neglect their heart and their spiritual condition and how they appear on the inside. Isn't that more important? It is, isn't it? <coughs> your thoughts, your attitudes, your actions, they reflect your priorities, what's important to you, what you value, what means the most to you. Do they not? They most certainly do. Our relationship with God must be, has to be, the most important thing in our lives. Has to be. Must be. Needs to be made top priority. Then when you do that, <clears throat> things fall in line, don't they? God comes first. He does. I believe that. Then I believe the family unit your husband and wife come second. I believe that because I believe the scriptures teach that. Then your children. And then your church family. See, you've got to understand and realize and not let these things get out of order. Most people, or not, I won't say most people, but a lot of people, you know what the most important thing in their life is? Their jobs, maybe. Their hobbies. And that's all geared toward what? Self. They worship themselves. They're not concerned about what other people need and what other people's... They're only concerned about what they want and pleasing themselves, so to speak. And they make themselves the number one priority. That won't work. If you want to be unhappy, do that. That's a recipe for being unhappy. When you want to be, when you choose to be selfish, you'll be one of the most miserable people there is on the face of the earth. You'll never be happy. Nothing can ever make you happy. Because people who are selfish try all the things that the world has to offer in order to make themselves happy. How long does that last, my friend? It doesn't, does it? It doesn't. The way to be happy is to give more blessed to give than is receive. Give of yourself to others. Put God first. Husband and wife, children, church family. Get your priorities in order. Get your heart right with the Lord, so to speak. Clean your heart up. You know, you have to take baths every so often, don't you? I guess it's according to how hard you work, how much you sweat, how often you have to take them anyway. If you didn't, you never use no deodorant. You never brushed your teeth. You'd be wondering, why are these people avoiding me? I mean, they're not going to be around me. or certainly not want to be around me. All right. So you periodically, habitually, regularly do what? Clean yourself up, don't you? We've got to do the same thing spiritually. Because we get dirty. We have a thought we shouldn't have. We say a word we shouldn't say. We do something we shouldn't do. We think something, like I said, we have a thought. All these things do what? Taint us spiritually, don't they? Certainly. 
But you see, here's the thing. You know, sometimes you get dirty, you have to scrub a little bit, don't you? I remember one time when we was kids, we got out, got to wallow around in some mud. We had no running water in the house that time. You know, we did, we, you know, that was when we was younger. And usually mom, when she'd give us a bath, she'd heat water up on the cook stove. You know, the electric stove, you know, give you some warm bath water. Not this time. Mm -mm. It, it was pretty cold. We got to go out on the porch on the outside, run some cold water in the tub, and she scrubbed us. I thought she was going to scrub the hide off of us because we were that dirty, that muddy. But it was necessary. I mean, you know, I wouldn't let us come in my house, my house either looking like that or like that. So. But here's the thing about it. Spiritually, there's a cleansing agent, my friend. You know, we see all these commercials on television about how this washing powder does this, this washing powder does this, you know. And I'll tell you the one, here, here's one now. Uh, you know, if you want to call it, issues I have with these people that advertise all these cleaning products. I don't know if your experience is any better than mine, but they've got so many products out there that supposedly gets rid of soap scum. Or just spray it out and it'll melt away. I'm going to tell you what, I've never found anything that melts soap scum away like that. You have to scrub that stuff off, don't you? Clean your bathtub, your shower. Spray that stuff on. It, it, it really melts it away, don't it? No, it don't either. You know what melts it away? Elbow grease. You get a brush, you scrub it off. That's what gets, that, that's all you can get rid of soap scum. Then it's hard to do, isn't it? It just really is. But anyway, the blood of Jesus, my friend, cleanses from all sin. Cleanses from all sin. So you can clean up spiritually, my friend, by acknowledging and confessing your sins and asking God to forgive you of your sins. And the Bible says he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's how you cleanse yourself spiritually. That's how you clean yourself up. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you thankful for that? You know, you get a bar of soap, you use it for so long, and finally you just kind of discard it because you don't get much off of it anymore. But you see the blood of Christ is an endless supply, isn't it? Look at how much cleansing goes on in today's time. All the people that sin, ask God to forgive them. Never ending supply, isn't it? So, you know, you decide whether or not it's that important. How important is it to cleanse yourself and make sure you're clean spiritually? Very important, isn't it? But the most important thing to begin with is to know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. I don't care what you've done, how dirty your life may seem, what? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Doesn't matter. All you have to do is look to Jesus in faith. But I'll close with this. Thief on the cross. We don't know anything else about him except that he was a thief. We don't even know his name. We didn't know that he was being put to death for the crimes that he had committed that, don't we? But we know that he looked over to Jesus. Or he looked over first to his, the other person that was being crucified along with him and Jesus and said, we're getting what we deserve. But this man had done nothing wrong. And he looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into that kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Forgiven, cleansed from all the sins of his past through how? Faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. And aren't you glad that as well, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, he becomes our advocate, our intercessor. And when we do, dirty ourselves up again. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgives our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Keep a clean heart. Keep a clean heart. Pure heart. If you don't know Christ today as your Lord and Savior, come this morning, put your faith and trust in him. And I encourage you as Christians to understand and to realize, look, we all get dirty. We all get tainted by this world that we live in, don't we? It's impossible not to, isn't it? How can you not? I mean, the things that you see that you're not looking to see, the things that you hear that you don't want to hear, you know, during the course of a day. But aren't you glad that we can immediately say, God, forgive me. 
cleanse me. Clean me back up. And he will. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning thanking and praising you once again, God, for the opportunity to be here. Lord, to lift up Jesus and to exalt him and to praise you, God, for your plan of salvation through faith in him. Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior, I pray today will be the day, Lord, they come and put their faith and trust in Jesus, acknowledge their sin, put their faith and trust in him, and receive salvation. And help us, God, to realize and to understand as believers, we need to stay on top, God, of our spiritual condition. Stay on top of the fact, God, that we can't allow our hearts to be tainted and dirtied up by this world that we live in. But God, we realize as well, the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. Thank you for each one here today. God, I pray to receive the blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand down and we sing a song of invitation. <laughs> Page 177. <laughs> Jesus shed on Calvary's cross for the sins of all. For all. I mean, the blood he shed has the power to cleanse from all sin. You've got to be willing to what? Accept it and let it be applied to your heart and life, my friend. Amen. Good to see you this morning. Anyone have a word now before we dismiss? Anybody? Now remember, we're going right after the service down to the river, right here at uh, where you, right before you get to the Edwin of Bridgeport Road, turns back up that way. They, 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 uh, Carolyn has graciously let us see we can park there, right, Joey? <coughs> we can park there, and we can park right there, and we'll walk right across the road down to the river. We've done that several times, about this right there. It's been cleaned off, so, you know, if you can and, and, and have the time, we'd love for you to come and join us in the path. We're going right now, right after service, to do just that. All right, any, uh, anything else we need to, to say at this time? Any other announcements or anything? Anyone got a word to say? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? All right, then. Uh, Stephen dismisses. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the last time in this house. Thank you all for the blessings you've given us this week. Thank you for this message. Lord, please help us, the ones that don't know you as their Savior. Help us to bring your word to them. Help us to go out into our world and our homes this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.